CEE Central Europe Explained An IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group Episode 3 Austria, Visegrad 4 and the Western Balkans Part 2 Minorities in the Central and Southeast European Region with Biljana Jovic Hello and welcome to everyone in this third podcast at CE, Central Europe Explained. My name is Silvia Najivan and I'm Deputy Managing Director of the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe, IDM. In the last episode of CE, we discussed on the role of Austria, its relationships and partnerships in Central and Southeast Europe, which was the first part of our series on Austria, Visegrad 4 and the Western Balkans. In today's podcast, we will discuss the situation of minorities in Central and especially Southeast Europe. Together with our guest, Mrs. Biljana Jovic, co-founder and president of the Belgrade-based Think and Action Tank, the Center for Migration Studies, we will take a closer look to the possibilities and challenges national and ethnic minorities face in our focus region. Hello, and thank you very much for your kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here today. And my first question, Biljana, is uh, what is the situation of minorities in Southeast Europe concretely in the Western Balkans like? Uh, first of all, I'm very happy that uh, um, your uh, organization has decided to tackle this important issue. Sometimes uh, we all have the impression that it has not been uh, the primary focus uh, of uh, uh, different think tanks and institutions, both in the region and uh, in the EU as a whole. Of course, we fully understand that there are many uh, pressing issues to deal with, but uh, somehow uh, we would hate to see that uh, this important issue of minority rights as one of the fundamental rights falls within the cracks. Um, when we talk about this region, it's important to understand its uh, historical and demographic challenges. Uh, we all know that this is the post-conflict area. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the conflict formally ended 20 years ago, but the wounds are still deep and, you know, or the scars still exist. So um, it's very difficult to go back to business as usual, as it has been the case in some other uh, regions in Europe. When we talk about the region, uh, we talk about six countries, and these are basically five countries that uh, have arisen from disintegration of former um, Yugoslavia plus Albania. And uh, um, when we talk about the former Yugoslavia, there is a difference between uh, traditional minorities and new minorities. And in many ways, the situation is more difficult for new minorities that are actually, um, that have ethnic origin from uh, the newly established countries. Um, there is um, also a negative impact of identity formation and the nation building in some countries because they, there is a tendency to have this separation between us and them which is counterproductive for uh, the effective integration of national minorities and full exercise of their rights. Then minorities are often subject to political influence, both from the dominant parties uh, on the national level, but also from the countries that they have origin from, uh, because they are not so uh, rarely <laughs> Uh, used as instruments in uh, long-standing uh, um, dispu disputes between uh, the countries of, particularly of former Yugoslavia. Um, there is also the difference between um, uh, low number and large number uh, uh, ethnic minorities. And to this end, um, a special question is the question of census, because if you want to know how many people of certain ethnic background you have in your country, uh, you have to ensure that, uh, you know, during the census, all uh, citizens of that ethnic background are registered adequately. Uh, the problem is that sometimes by certain ethnic minorities, and this was the case, for instance, uh, with the census in Serbia uh, in 2011, uh, Albanian uh, community decided to boycott the census. And uh, as a consequence, uh, they um, 
there are only uh, there is only a, a small um, number of Albanian citizens or citizens of Albanian background registered uh, in Serbia, which has had the impact, negative impact on uh, uh, different instruments that ensure uh, uh, full exercise of minority rights in this country. Um, of course, large uh, uh, numbered uh, minorities uh, have more leverage in uh, their fight for uh, um, uh, their rights. And, uh, and there is also a difference in capacity uh, between the small number and large number minorities and also between uh, traditional and new minorities. Um, then uh, we also have, you know, I, I've started with problems, so I apologize, <laughs> you know, we'll switch to some positive aspects, I promise. <laughs> um, uh, then there is a difference um, in the recognition of national minorities as such in national legislations of the countries. Uh, some countries recognize ethnic minorities in their constitutions, some others don't. Um, but I cannot say that this is typical for the, you know, for these countries uh, uh, um, only. This is not an exclusive challenge for uh, the Western Balkans countries because there are some um, members of the European Union that uh, also have a very diverse approach uh, to these issues. Um, there is also a difference uh, uh, in solutions provided by the legislation in all the countries of the Western Balkans. Um, the candidate countries have to adjust their framework to the existing uh, standards of the European Union. And when it, we talk about the candidate countries, uh, uh, when it comes to the Western Balkans, we talk about two countries, uh, Serbia and Montenegro, uh, that are uh, you know, uh, well uh, into the negotiations process. Um, and uh, also in, within this negotiation process, they have to tackle these issues through uh, the negotiation chapter of, on fundamental rights and rule of law. Um, the other countries that are about to start in negotiations, and this process has been delayed, uh, this is, um, we are talking about North Macedonia and Albania. We expect that the negotiations will start very soon. Things have been a bit derailed by the, the ongoing uh, uh, health crisis that we have in the world. And then we have Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo that to my regret, these countries are still very, very far, uh, you know, from starting this process. And of course, it has the impact on the situation uh, in, um, uh, in these countries as well, because um, the incentives of European, uh, of the membership in the European Union is, is very, are very uh, strong um, uh, in pushing uh, the elites in, in these countries to adhere to the standards that exist in the, in the European Union. When we talk about the European uh, Union and uh, the, the way um, uh, this issue is approached uh, by the EU countries, uh, there is also, as I mentioned, diversity in the approach because there are a number of instruments, legal instruments and mechanisms that the EU uh, uses uh, to ensure at least some kind of uniformity in addressing this issue. But uh, as we all know, the EU does not have a very uh, strong and firm and you know, a detailed um, framework, common framework when it comes to uh, legal framework when it comes to the minority issues. Do you think uh, the, the Europe, uh, European Union lost its glance uh, regarding um, um, establishing and implementing uh, necessary standards uh, for the EU enlargement process? Definitely. And uh, uh, this has had uh, uh, a very uh, counterproductive or negative impact on the region as a whole, because uh, the perspective of EU integration has uh, a very strong cohesive uh, uh, impact on the region. And with, with uh, the numerous uh, crises that we have seen recently, and of course, uh, the pandemic crisis, the ongoing pandemic crisis, perhaps being the most striking, but also the process of internal reforms in, uh, in the EU has made uh, the countries in the region, uh, their elites and pub the general public uh, as well, lose their perspective uh, uh, when it comes to the, you know, their, the common European future. Uh, and uh, this has happened regardless of repeated declarations by both um, 
the EU institutions in Brussels and individual capitals uh, when it comes to the heavy hitters in the European Union, if I may use this word, you know, everybody is repeating that um, there is still European perspective for the region, but somehow uh, for the people living in the region, uh, it's, it doesn't appear to be within their reach. Do people and then also um, people of minorities believe uh, in European integration and because the European integration process is, is a process of 20 years now and the waiting room and, and especially what is the situation of minorities in, in, in that context uh, regarding uh, human rights and political participation? Uh, there is a, a certain level of fatigue uh, in the general population in all these countries. Uh, uh, and, you know, I think that this is a very important element that we should uh, look into. Um, because, as you said, um, many or all these countries have been in the waiting room for a very long time. The enthusiasm about the process uh, when the negotiations started uh, for Montenegro and Serbia was fairly high, but it seems to be fading. Uh, and it's not only uh, because of um, the processes that, you, that we see in the EU itself. There have been disconcerting processes uh, uh, in uh, the countries in the region as well. Uh, that because of, of this situation and because of many factors, both internal and external, many influences uh, um, are somehow uh, become, you know, getting more and more distant from the course that uh, was originally set at the beginning of this process, because you're right, you know. And I think that it's also very uh, counterproductive to, you know, to have different dates that float, uh, uh, in, you know, in the media, in the public, and, you know, uh, because then you have very high hopes that something will start on a certain date. And uh, then it turns out that this is not a realistic uh, forecast. So, and, and we have seen that many times. And I cannot say that uh, uh, to this end, uh, minority uh, communities are more affected by the, you know, than the general population, because I can, I can say that everybody feels equally affected by this. When it comes to the national minority communities in the region, uh, particularly those that uh, have the countries of origin that are members of the European Union. Most of them, you know, are tired of this waiting process and are, they're simply applying for citizenship of their countries of origin. And basically, when, as soon as they get uh, the passports, they, they leave the region. So one of the, of the really, really critical issues in the region is the brain drain that we have seen here because you know most of the people who can who get their citizenship uh, um, and who who get uh, the passport simply leave uh, in search for a better life uh, you you concretely mean if i may ask uh, the romanian and bulgarian minorities in serbia for instance uh, yes, who exactly. have the right to to take the citizenship and then belong to uh, the european union as a citizen yeah yes exactly but it also applies to uh, hungary uh, or hungarians mm -hmm. uh, um, and also to croatians uh, you know because you know if you if you can mm -hmm. prove there are certain criteria to show that you're eligible for citizenships. Uh, uh, you meet that criteria and you get a passport. Most of the young people simply pack up and leave. And it's not only for, you know, the countries in the region, but because you also have, you know, people um, of Slovak background, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. who also leave the country. And this is, this is really difficult because, you know, because of these mig my, uh, migration trends, then it becomes more difficult for the... Uh, um, minority communities themselves to plan for the future and to fight for their rights. And uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, in Serbia and in Kosovo, uh, uh, there will be um, a new cycle, new census cycle next year. And it will be very interesting to see uh, the numbers. Uh, but as I said, you cannot really uh, say that this is something that um, applies to uh, uh, the minority communities alone. You know, it, it affects the general population in the region. 
regarding the uh, minorities and then the situation of minorities um, and uh, their political participation by law in the Western Balkan six, minority political parties do not have to pass the census of parliamentary elections and a part of various governments. So, Biljana, what are your experiences and uh, what can all the experiences say uh, on uh, the political participation of uh, minority parties in uh, governments? For example, Rasim Ljajic in Serbia is part of the government uh, for many years. And what are the outcomes and effects by now? Um, the thing is that, and this is a very good question, uh, uh, and thank you very much for that question. Basically, there have been some recent changes of the election laws, particularly in Serbia. Uh, minority, national minority parties have been for a very long time, um, uh, have re- received a favorable treatment when it comes to the, to the electoral law. And they, yes, they um, have uh, uh, an opportunity to... Uh, um, organize and register a political party um, uh, in a much easier way compared to uh, uh, the majority political parties. And uh, the, they do not have to pass the sense that there is no threshold for them to, to enter the parliament. Um, we have, uh, we've had, you have mentioned uh, one of the parties uh, of the Bosniak community in Serbia that has been member uh, uh, or participated in the executive power in the country for 20 years now. However, there are two additional parties in that community. And then in many ways, they feel underrepresented, uh, you know. So you cannot really say that the community as a whole has uh, uh, acknowledged that uh, the process of their integration has been uh, very, very uh, uh, successful. There is no doubt that uh, the participation of this party has had a very positive impact uh, on um, uh, the development of uh, the, um, the region where you have the majority uh, uh, of the Bosniaks living in Serbia. However, um, there is much more than that. You know, uh, when uh, Hungarian political parties are coalition partners of the ruling party uh, in Serbia, and they have uh, uh, been very well organized, and they. They themselves say that this is, uh, you know, the, the best uh, era of um, for the Hungarians living in Serbia because uh, they have um, taken advantage of this participation uh, in both uh, the legislative and executive uh, uh, government in or power in in the country. Um, however, uh, there you have other minorities that are also. Uh, uh, represented in the parliament, whose role has been reduced to window dressing. You know, they don't really have um, the. Vo- I mean, they do have the voice, but their voice is not heard. And this is exclusive flaw uh, in Serbia. You can say that for the region as a whole. You know, formally they are represented, but whether they have the um, actual power in their hands. Uh, I would I would strongly disagree about that, and this is something that we still have to work on um, in the region, uh, both internally, but also with the help from organizations like yours, with the help from European Parliament, etc. Biljana, many, many thanks for your deep insight uh, into the situation of minorities in Southeastern Europe. What you now described uh, is the problem of stabilocracies in the region and uh, having facade parties, uh, which is also the reality for minority uh, parties and and minority communities. Uh, Many thanks, Biljana. In um, the next episode, episode number four, we will discuss the topic coal and steel versus iron lessons for today. Thank you for listening to the third episode of CE, Central Europe Explained, powered by Erste Group. We are looking forward to the next episode and see you soon. Thank you very much. IDM Podcast. Institute für den Donauraum und Mitteleuropa. Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe. European Perspectives. Regional Actions. Cooperation and expertise since 1953.